This is a bit. It's kind of retro, but still modern, and a little bit funky. And yes, it's pink. So what? Get over it. Here's how I built it. This is a king size bed made completely from soft maple. I started with rough sawn material, 6 quarter for the frame rails, 8 quarter for the mattress and headboard supports, and 4 quarter for the headboard itself. I began by milling all of the 6 quarter and 8 quarter material for the bed frame and supports. The frame rails are brought to a finished thickness of one and a quarter inches, and the supports will be one and a half inches thick. The widths and lengths have been left oversized, and will be trimmed to a final dimension later. After squaring up both faces and one edge with the joiner and planer, I ran all of the material through a wide belt sander, which saved me a ton of time. This allowed me to bring the parts to a precise final dimension while sanding to 120 grit. Only minimal finish sanding will be required later. I was able to find wide enough stock for all of the frame and support parts except for one of the frame rails, so here I am gluing up a panel that will become the header. Next, I move on to ripping the four frame rails to their finished widths. The header and footer are 7.5 inches wide, and the side rails are 5.5 inches. Then the rails get trimmed to final length. The header and footer are 79.5 inches long and the side rails 81 inches. This is all based on the slat base and mattress that I chose. I decided to go with knockdown cross dowel joinery for the bed frame. Here I am using the woodpecker's cross dowel jig to drill for the hardware that will hold the frame together. The side rails get drilled for a cross dowel on their inside face and for a 3 8 inch hole in the end grain. The jig ensures that the center lines of these two holes are aligned by allowing them to be drilled at the same time without moving the drill guide. The header and footer get a counterbore to recess the bolt head and washer, and a 3 8 inch through hole to allow the hardware to pass through into the side rails where they will thread into the frost out. Since the header and footer are taller than the side rails, I mark them with a reference to line up the edge of the jig for the top mounting point. This jig is amazingly accurate and resulted in joints that are both exceptionally strong and perfectly aligned. This joinery will allow me to take the bed apart for transportation and makes the finishing process much easier as well. Next, I drill out the header to accept the hardware that secures the headboard supports to the frame. I'm using the same counterbore and 3 8 inch through hole as the supports will be attached with 3 8 inch bolts, washers, and nuts. The header and footboard then get a decorative radius on their top corners. I'm doing this with a shop made jig that references two sides and a top bearing flush trim bit in a palm router. I make the first pass with the jig in place then remove the jig and run the bearing against the surface I just routed. Due to the thickness of the material and the length of my bit, I then had to turn over the rails and run a final pass with the jig, leaving a perfect 1.5 inch radius all the way through.
Next, I move on to the mattress supports. There will be three supports, all one and a half inches square. Two will attach to the inside of the side rails, and the third will act as a center support for the slat base and mattress. Here, I am ripping them square and then trimming them to final length. The center support will attach to the header and footer with half laps and matching brackets. I cut the half lap joinery at the table saw. I start by running a curve cut in the backer on my miter gauge and then marking the stop and start of each half lap on the top of the workpiece so I can easily line it up with the curve mark in the miter gauge, always making sure to line up the cut with the correct side of the blade. I take several passes to remove the waste and then use the speed tenon method to clean up the cut. If you are not comfortable with the table saw or do not feel this is safe, please don't try it. The brackets and center support all get counterboard and pre-drilled for quarter inch by two and a half inch washer head lag screws. They then get glued and clamped in place while driving the screws. These are structural fasteners and along with glue will be way more than strong enough for this application, even considering my large stature. The last step in the base construction is to attach the hairpin legs and adjustable feet for the center support. I went with half inch, three rod by eight inch tall hairpin legs from DIYHairpinLegs.com. They are extremely well made and will look great with the mid-century vibe of this bed and our space. The adjustable feet for the center support were purchased from Ikea. All of the legs get attached with number 10 by one and a quarter inch screws. Next, we move on to working on the headboard supports. There are six supports in total. They will attach to the header rail and hold the headboard in place at a nice 10 degree angle. I will be using a template to pattern route the supports. I start by tracing the template onto the work pieces, always looking for the best grain flow through the curve in the support. I then rough out the work pieces at the bandsaw before attaching the template with two-sided tape and moving to the router table to flush trim each support to a perfect final shape. I'm using a half inch compression spiral flush trim bit by Whiteside from Bits and Bits Company. It has their proprietary Astra coating that increases cutter life and allows for faster feed rates and router speeds. This bit has a one and a half inch cutter length, so it is just long enough to flush trim these blanks in one pass, leaving an amazing surface regardless of grain direction. Here, I am drilling for the hardware that will mount the supports to the header rail. Again, there is a counterboard and a 3 8 inch through hole. The bottom of each support gets drilled for two mounting points where it will attach to the header. This setup with the woodpecker's drill press table makes this operation quick and accurate. I can change the bit while retaining the center locations with the use of the production stops.
Then, I move on to drilling the mounting points for the headboard, which will be attached to the supports with quarter inch bolts and threaded inserts. Because the headboard will be made from solid wood, I needed to account for seasonal wood movement. The bottom mounting point is drilled oversized with a half inch bit to allow room for expansion and contraction around the quarter inch bolt. The top mounting point is fixed and drilled with a quarter inch bit. This will allow the headboard to expand, but only in one direction, downwards behind the mattress. The supports are done, so all that is left is the headboard. I start by milling all of the four quarter lumber to a final thickness of three quarters of an inch. After I've milled up all of the boards to final thickness and cleaned up one edge at the joiner, I rip them to final width at the table saw. Because I want to keep as much thickness as possible and reduce sanding and cleanup time after glue up, I prefer to use dominoes to aid in aligning boards when gluing up large panels. The headboard will be a finished width of 20 inches and almost 80 inches long so this method will help keep everything nice and flat and aligned in the clamps. It is also very difficult to face joint boards this long on a shorter 6 inch joiner, so the dominoes will help counteract any residual bowing that couldn't be taken out during the milling process. The headboard is then trimmed to final dimension. The track saw is a perfect tool for this job. I can very easily get clean, square cuts without trying to wrangle this massive headboard over the table saw. The corners of the headboard get the same radius treatment as the header and footer rails. I first trim the excess with a jigsaw, and then use the same routing procedure as earlier, but this time, I use a jig with a 3 inch radius for a more pronounced look. There is something just so satisfying about a well-made jig and a flush trim router bit. You could stop right here and I think the design would be great, but I took it a step further and added a nice graphic touch to the front of the headboard by routing a shallow design with triangular patterns. I just played with the design by laying out with a pencil and straight edge until I found one that I liked. I made a quick straight edge for my plunge router and used a quarter inch spiral bit set to a depth of 3 16 7 inch. I added waste pieces to each side of the headboard to support the cut as the router exited the workpiece. 
There was one spot where I couldn't add a second clamp to the jig, so I used some two-sided tape to keep it from moving while I routed the groove. The final step of the construction process is to add the threaded inserts to the back of the headboard. I carefully laid out the location for each insert, making sure they would accurately line up with the mounting points and the headboard supports. Then I drilled a pilot hole using a thick block as a guide to keep the bit perpendicular and a stop collar on the drill bit to set the depth. I chamfered the edge of each pilot hole to prevent blowout when driving the threaded inserts. Then I used an insert driver I found on Amazon to seat them in the headboard. After a final sanding, it was on to primer and top coat. I went with Chemaqua Plus from Sherwin-Williams. It is a pigmented water-based lacquer that is commonly used on millwork and cabinetry, so I know it will be a durable and lasting finish. It can be tinted to just about any color you choose and is much thinner than latex, so it sprays like a dream, especially with my new spray port 6003 from Earlex. This was a recent upgrade from a smaller HVLP unit. It has so much more power. No thinning was required. It sprayed a flawless finish right out of the can. As a finishing touch, I like to add these small logo pucks that are laser cut and engraved. It is a nice clean install with a matching Forstner bit and is a perfect solution for painted projects where a branding iron won't do. I installed this one on the back of the headboard. Finally, it's on to assembly. I started in the workshop by attaching the headboard supports to the back of the headboard. I left them only finger tight for now so I can make adjustments later when attaching to the base if needed. Assembling the frame is as simple as inserting the cross dowels into the side rails and then attaching them to the header and footer with 3 8 inch bolts and washers. This is an unbelievably strong connection, but can be easily disassembled should I ever need to move the bed. The center support gets attached with one screw at each end. Next, I flipped up the bed frame and attached the legs and the adjustable feet. With an extra set of hands, we attach the headboard and supports to the frame with 12 3 8 inch bolts, nuts, and washers. I got each of them started before tightening any of them down all the way. After adding a slatted base we purchased at IKEA, it was time for a new mattress. I was thrilled that Tuft & Needle agreed to work with us on this project. I spent hours researching bed-in-a-box companies and was blown away by the sheer number of positive reviews they received, as well as their simple, no questions asked, 100 night trial period. We went with the original, and it's an unbelievable value. After sleeping on this new bed for over a week, we can't believe we didn't upgrade sooner. We even got an awesome set of sheets from Tuft & Needle to go with the new mattress. Check out the link in the description for more information on Tuft & Needle, as well as some of the other tools and materials I mentioned in this video.